Hello, and a big warm welcome to 2021 SAP Business One virtual event. And thank you all for joining us this morning from wherever you happen to be in Australia, New Zealand, or Fiji. So let's meet the team online today. Okay, so Amanda here, as many of you will know me, and uh, I'm joined by Yaro Bailey, a senior SAP Business One Development Manager, and he'll be doing some of the MCing today. Also with us in the house is Andre Pinier. Uh, he's head of SAP Business One at SAP, and he used to work with us at Microchannel. Um, also, many of you will know Kishan Solanke, uh, SAP Business One Manager, and Ashvin Hargovan. So he is at Senior Consultant, and he's worked in Australia, New Zealand, and Fiji. So handing over to you, Yaro, to read through the agenda. What's uh, on for today? Thank you, Amanda. The first point there is the uh, from Andre. We've got a discussion there around the updates of SAP, the actual roadmap for SAP Business One. Uh, then we're going on to Ketan, who will be going through what's new in the current version of version 10. And then we'll go on to the uh, MI portal or my portal. And we'll go into the final section, which will be the upskill SAP Business One tips and tricks. And then we'll go into ask the experts. All right, thank you uh, for joining us today. And I'll hand over to Andre. Excellent. Thanks, Yaro. Good morning, customers, and thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about SAP Business One's future and our commitment to the platform. I'll be discussing content from the SAP Business One product roadmap, which uh, some of you might be aware, but we publish this on our website and it's available to the public. So please follow the link in my slide for more details. And it will also be distributed by the micro channel team afterwards. Excellent. So before I get into more detail, I just wanted to emphasize our very successful and experienced ecosystem. And thank you all for being a part of our community. I'm very proud to share that we now have over 70,000 customers using SAP Business One across 170 countries in 28 languages. Arguably one of the most used SME ERP solutions worldwide and evidence that you've made the right choice to invest in SAP Business One and Micro Channel. SAP is completely committed and will continue investing in SAP Business One now and into the future. Strategically, the SME segment remains a core focus area for SAP globally. And our strategy is built on delivering the intelligent enterprise for our customers. Yes, I know you're probably saying another buzzword from SAP, but let me explain. Our vision is to strengthen the SAP Business One solution as the right ERP for SMEs in the digital economy, providing you with flexibility in terms of deployment models, a solid global business core, and also a state-of-the-art user experience. We will deliver on our vision by focusing our future investment in providing a global and highly scalable real-time ERP through continuous improvements and enhancing our localizations. SAP HANA will continue to be our engine for innovation and our product engineering team will leverage the advantages and capabilities to provide additional business value for our SAP Business One customers. Extensibility and integration remain a necessity for any modern business application. And by introducing new components to our service layer technology and integration framework, we will offer our ecosystem with an, an advanced developer experience. In my opinion, our ability to extend and adapt the solution is one of our key differentiators in the market. And by adopting these innovations, our customers will amplify their unique business value and also increase their competitive advantage. We understand that all of this sounds very promising, but unless we succeed in providing a simple and intuitive user experience, we jeopardize the business value 
that such a solution can bring to you. My goal today is not to step you through um, the roadmap in detail, which uh, you can look up, but rather to leave you with a few key takeaways in terms of our planned innovations and future product direction. If you guys don't remember anything about my session, apart from the following today, I'll be satisfied, right? So the key areas is user experience. We will significantly ramp up our efforts to deliver a state-of-the-art web client with extended functional coverage and a framework for extensibility. Based on my discussions with product management, this is by far the highest priority for the immediate future. Apart from that, we also are gonna be focusing on applied intelligence. We will leverage our broader platform to deliver and enrich our SAP Business One application with modern technology and automation capability through AI, IoT, and machine learning elements to provide our customers with the ability to innovate their businesses by utilizing the broader SAP platform. And finally, simplification, right? We are working on simplifying our technology landscape to enable our partners and customers to reduce deployment time and also their total cost of ownership. And with that, I'd like to thank you and uh, hand back to Ketan to demonstrate in more detail our recent progress towards our vision. Over to you, Ketan. Thanks, Andre, for those in insights into uh, SAP's plans and roadmap. All right, so we're now going to look at uh, version 10 updates. So uh, a lot of you may remember we've already had a couple of sessions, uh, one of them back probably around 18 months ago when uh, version 10 was first released. We had a session going through some of the highlights. And then later on, um, around June last year, we did another session just looking at some of the additional enhancements uh, that, that were introduced uh, um, with, with their new releases of additional patches. So one of the things you may notice that SAP has moved away from uh, uh, releasing patch levels and the naming convention is now feature packs. So every there's a new feature pack released every three months. So we we went through back in June we went through feature pack 2008. Since uh, since then there was a feature pack uh, 2011 and then the most recent feature pack that's been released is. Uh, 2102. So the numbering convention is the first two digits represent the year and the second two digits represent the month. So um, 2102 uh, was released about two weeks ago um, and we will be touching on some of the um, enhancements released in that version plus uh, what was also introduced in one of the prior versions uh, back, in, uh, back in November. Um, just also note uh, those videos with the version 10 updates and highlights are um, on our YouTube channel. So you can always go and, and look at those uh, at your own pleasure or leisure. Uh, but uh, af after this session, at the end of this session, you'll also have an opportunity to ask any questions you may have around version 10. So without much more to do, let's get into the, uh, the system. So the first, thing I want to do is just have a quick look at the web client again. We've, we've done that extensively in the June session, but I just thought it would be worth highlighting what the web client looks like and where it's heading. So because of SAP's introduction of the service layer for the SQL version as well as HANA, the web client is now available for SQL version as well. So as you can see, this is kind of the interface uh, you get. Um, and what I just want to do today is just look at what functionality is available um, as standard in the web client today as it stands. So within the sales area, you can create quotations and view existing quotations. You can look at uh, orders and create orders. You can view draft sales documents. You can look at documents in approval. 
you can create or view deliveries, create or view uh, invoices, um, and also view view only returns, credits. Um, plus, you can also manage items, uh, create and manage items. And the purchasing front, right now, you can only view existing transactions. Um, there isn't any capability to add new transactions, but this is something that's sort of being worked on by SAP. Um, and if you if you look at the roadmap, then the next sort of focus is getting some of the purchasing parts implemented, and then looking at opportunity management as well as service. They sort of so the whole sort of focus is getting the CRM aspects of uh, of the web client um, in play, and then you know bringing in the rest of the um, functionality um, uh, that you're used to in the traditional client. Um, you can also create um, business partners, manage business partners, as well as do some activity management as well. So what I might just do is just give you a bit of a flavor of what um, a order entry process looks like. So if I go into the sales orders area, get a listing of um, orders, um, if I wanted to create a new one, I'd have to go back and into the main menu and just select the create order option. Once I'm in there, then I can select a customer. And, you know, there is wildcard search capabilities. And I can select one of the customers, put in a delivery date. and then go into the contents area and start adding items again once i have to go into the um, search area and then i can do wildcard searching and then do multi-select off the back of that once i've loaded the items in i can amend quantities if i need to and uh, i can also put freight related information in, any discounting, and then I can do an add and view, or I could do, you know, add and back and so on. So I'm just gonna do add and view. So that's created the order, or it is creating the order now. And if I'm happy with that order, or the customer accepts the order, I can copy to, so you can see that, that copy to buttons at the top there. I can convert that into a delivery and everything pulls through just as you would expect. Um, and then again, once more, you can review the information, adjust anything required, again, add it. Now, what's also nice is, you know, the relationship map you're used to seeing in the traditional client, you can also see within the web client. So that's that's all there as well. So. You know, if you've got uh, salespeople, you know, more sales focused people that may just need access to SAP without having to load up the client, maybe they're on the field, on the road, this is probably a good interface uh, to use. Um, currently, no customizations possible. You know, your formatted searches and things like that will not work, but if you're just after just an interface into the system, then it's a pretty useful uh, tool to have. All right, so I'm not, that's that's all I'm going to cover around the web client. Um, suffice to say that SAP is investing a lot into this, and you know, over the next few releases, we're going to see more functionality coming into this. And if you do want to see uh, more information or more detailed presentation around this, uh, please go and see the YouTube channel. Uh, we did uh, cover this uh, back in June. All right, so now what I'm going to do is look at more specifically um enhancements that have been put in play in the last two feature packs uh, from sap um, so the first one um, that we've got is uh, the ability to update um, you know certain fields within journal entries uh, even if the period is locked so you have to activate this through the uh, um, document settings area in there if you select uh, journal entries you'll see some additional um, options around being able to update references, remarks, and UDFs on journals with locked 
posting periods. So even if the period's been locked, there are still certain fields you can update on those uh, um, on those journal entries. So you know, just to um, show you what fields in particular we're talking about, um, it's is these remarks, these references fields that that will be available. All right. Next uh, enhancement we're going to look at is uh, the consolidating business partner functionality. You know, you, when you go into a business partner, you can define a parent-child relationship. And that's under the accounting tab where you can say there is a payment consolidation and who the consolidating business partner is. What's been enhanced is if you are now, let's say, posting um, an invoice, and when you're doing that, you've got the ability to define a different consolidator dating business partner. So for whatever reason, this particular transaction needs to be consolidated with a different business partner, or you know, typically this customer doesn't get consolidated, but you do want to consolidate them to someone else, then you've got the ability to do that. Right. The next uh, enhancement we're going to look at is, is on the business, on the item master data. But before I do that, I'm going to show you what, what is currently or what was available till re recently, uh, which is you can go into the um, sales order screen and you can right click and you can say, show me the last prices. Right? And then it sort of gives you a report of all the pricing and, and so on. Now, what's been enhanced is on the item master data itself, you now have the same ability. You can now go into an item master and say, show me the last prices. Um, and then, you know, apply whatever filters and you get the same uh, information without having to open up a sales transaction. So it just gives you a bit more insight and usability. Um, the next enhancement is a small one, again, relating to the item master screen, but again, a good usability related enhancement, which is on the, on the purchasing data tab where you define your preferred supplier, you can now actually see the name of the supplier. You know, you don't have to go and drill into the business partner to see what the name is. Uh, that name is already visible on the item master screen. Okay, um, the next enhancement we're going to look at is the ability to update the, um, the sales and purchase item checkboxes for, for items that are components in the bill of material. So, up till now, if you had an item that was part of a bill of material, you couldn't come into the item master and just untick those options. Um, you'd get an error message saying, this is linked to a bomb, please, and then you'd have to remove it from the bomb, change the checks, and then go back and update the bombs. What's been enhanced is now, if I go and open up an existing bill of material, Let's say this bill of material is a sales bill of material, which has got two items. If I drill into one of them and I can go and untick purchase item, right? It, it doesn't stop me from doing that. Now, however, if I try to untick the sales item, it'll stop me because this item's part of a sales kit. So it doesn't make sense that I'm unticking this and it's still part of a sales bomb because the only place you can sell a sales bomb is through a sales transaction. So so it's still got some smarts around it, but you can untick the purchase item for items that are components of sales forms. Now, likewise, if it's an item that is only a um, um, part of a production bomb, so I'm just going to open up a production bomb here. Any one of these items are part of a production bomb. I can untick both sales and purchasing without having to do, you know, remove those items from the bill of material. So just again, some additional uh, usability type enhancements. Uh, the next enhancement is around the duplicate um, customer or supplier reference number check. So 
if we go look at the again this setting is under the document settings area under administration system initialization document settings and if you look at particularly around the ab invoice um, side you see here it's uh you've always had you know when duplicate reference occurs you can do a warning no warning or block and then at some point there was an in, there was an additional function introduced to allow checks across all suppliers or individual suppliers so you know if the same reference number occurs for a different supplier do not block but now you've got another one which says check the duplicates in the current fiscal year only so you may have a supplier who restarts their numbering sequence every year and you, you might end up getting the same you know invoice number from them you know in, in different years and you don't want you want to ignore that check in that case so you can sort of uh, tick this box and and put that in place so that's that's another small enhancement around around checking and validation um, the next enhancement we're going to look at is uh, the ability to add a reference to the original document when you duplicate a transaction. So what do I mean by that? We go into a sales order and let's say I want to duplicate this sales order. So I go right click and duplicate. Now when I do that, it, it's now asking me, do you want to create a reference between the original and the duplicate documents? I can, I can choose to say yes or no, it's up to me. So if I do say yes, um, and then if I just select my customer, and then when I go into the accounting tab, I'll see this reference document. Now this reference document was introduced at some point in version 9 point, 9 point something, but what's been enhanced is now if you duplicate transactions, it creates a link. So you know, it's already got the link to the previous order. I can I can link other transactions here. I can link the purchase order if I wanted to. You know, I can link a um, incoming payment. I can also put some remarks against each one of those. Okay. So once I've added that order, uh, once I've added that order, what happens then is when I do my relationship map. Now, there's a few options here now. So one of the options is reference documents. When I select that, we see links for all those different transactions that were that were referenced uh, against the uh, against the original order. So just another another enhancement around usability. All right, next next one, um, the ability to see change log on authorizations particularly for group based authorizations so what do i mean here if i go into administration system initialization and authorizations general authorizations in the groups area if you have if you are using authorization groups if you are changing authorizations so for example if i go in and say you know this is the inventory group but they also get access to um, Read only access to service calls, for example. Then, when I go and look at the change log, I can see, you know, the service calls. Previously, there was no authorization, and now there's a read only authorization. So this uh, this was kind of was already available for user based authorizations. Now it's also available for uh, group based authorizations as well. Um, next authorization. Um, this one's quite useful for people who have been using SAP for a long time. You know, we've got clients who've been now on, on the system for close to 15 years. People come, people go. You've got a you know list of users that's you know much longer than the actual active users in the system. So now we've got a new checkbox uh, in some specific screens which allow you to hide locked users. So let's let's have a look at uh, that function. So for example, if you're doing add-on administration, you go into user preferences. Here you can say, well, hide locked users. So what will happen is this list of users will not show anyone who's been marked as hidden. 
Um, so if, if an employee leaves this company, you essentially go in and mark the user as locked. And then in a number of these screens, you have the ability to hide um, those, uh, those users so you don't need to look at them. So the other place where you've got that ability is under UI configuration templates. So in here as well, when you're managing the users, you can go in and say hide locked users. Again, that will get rid of people you're not, you're not really working with anymore. The other place uh, that same um, functionality is available is where you're doing copy, um, copy users. So under setup, general users, and let's say you're copying authorizations from one uh, or copy form settings from one user to another. In here as well, you can hide locked users. What's also neat here is on this screen, you now have the ability to copy specific form settings. So if I want to copy the currently logged in user to let's say my user Sophie, and I only want to copy to Sophie the sales order screen. So you know I can do that. I can I can now just say copy sales orders and delivery form settings from my login to Sophie's login. So you know this this gives you more granularity around the copy of uh, settings uh, forms, particularly form settings from one user to another. Now the final one is in the alerts management area. And, and that's that's got a bit of an enhancement as well. If you go into the alerts management, you now have some additional functionality. You can, you know, you get an initial screen that shows, says, show me just active alerts or show me all alerts. And then, you know, you can even see on the screen what query is linked to, whether it's active, whether you want to save history, you can manage a lot of that there. But once you get into the actual alert itself, once again, you've got the hide locked user option, but you also get an option that says display only users with assigned alerts. So, you know, if you're, if you're going into an alert and you want to see who's getting it, you know, rather than scrolling all the way up and down and trying to sort of remember who was ticked, who was not ticked, you can just say, display users with assigned alerts and you get a quick look at who's, who's, who's been assigned those alerts. Okay, um, next, um, next enhancement we're going to look at is, uh, you might all re recall there is a copy table function that was introduced perhaps in version 9. Um, so you, if you're on any grid, you can right click on the grid and say copy table. Yeah, now that's the same as being able to export data to Excel, right? You can go in, click copy table, and if you if you opened up um, Excel, you can just paste the data in there. Now, what's what's enhanced in version uh, version ten, particularly feature pack um, twenty eleven, is an additional authorization around that. You go into general authorizations and. I just search. So there's a, there's a new authorization called copy table, pretty much next to export to Excel. And you can say, well, this person's not allowed to do copy table. Okay. Um, next uh, enhancement we're going to look at is uh, the form setting screen itself and the ability to find things a lot quicker. So you've got this find next button that, that came in at some point in, in, in re more recent releases, perhaps version 10, but has been slightly enhanced again because previously the search was based on the text beginning with uh, the information you've typed in here. Now it's doing a full sort of uh, wildcard search. So it's doing a contained search. So I can go price, so there's unit price, then I go find next, price after discount, find next, cross price after discount. So it's searching for that string inside the text rather than just the text being what it starts with. Okay, um, the next enhancement, this is this is a pretty handy one. If you are having queries in the system and you want to publish them into the normal menu. So you have a query and uh, 
let's say there's the query there. We can quite simply go in and say, now assign this to the menu. And you go in and you sort of specify, you know, where it needs to go, who the parent item is, where do you want to place it, and put all those details in. And once you've done that, basically what happens is that particular query appears in the menu under the area you've defined. So there it is, customer list, and you can click and run it. What's also nice is that when you run it from that one, from the menu system, you do not see the actual underlying SQL query, right? Whereas if you run it from the query manager, you know, it can look a bit weird for people who are not so technical. So there's a neat little enhancement to get, get your queries into the menu system for ease of access. So some other enhancements, one of them is in relation to opportunities management. Under the authorizations area, or rather, let's just look at the opportunity screen first. So when you're doing an opportunity, you, you have the ability to just right click and remove the opportunity. And if you do that, all traces of that opportunity disappear from the system. Um, what SAP have introduced now is the ability to set an authorization relating to that. So if I went into um, opportunities management, there's some special opportunities related authorizations, one that says don't allow a certain person to remove an opportunity. All right, next enhancement is related to the procurement confirmation business. So if you're doing back-to-back -back purchasing and for whatever reason you've made a mistake in creation of your purchase order or production order, if you cancel that particular transaction and you need to recreate um, the purchase order, then you, you cannot do it without having that link through the relationship map because uh, you know that that particular sales order line's already been linked. So so there is an enhancement around that which allows you to now allows you to now um, your system will ask you a question of whether you want to recreate a a back to back on that particular transaction once uh, once you've done the cancellation. So that setting sits under the sales order. And so there it is, display base document items in procurement confirmation visit when target documents are canceled. And you can do that with or without user confirmation. So what do I mean by that? So let's have a look. So if I go into sales order, and there's the sales order we created earlier. I want to create a back-to-back, -back, so I'll go tick procure non-dropship -drop items, and I click update. So when I do that, I get the procurement confirmation visit. I go through, I can see that there'll be two purchase orders created, and I generate those purchase orders. Purchase orders have been generated. Once they've been generated, I realize that I made a mistake. I really don't want to buy this from, you know, Far East Imports, so I go in and cancel the purchase order. At the time of the cancellation, I'll get a few questions. So firstly, it's just saying, you know, are you sure this is related to a sales document? I say yes. Then it's also saying to me that, you know, this status will be canceled, will not appear anywhere. And finally, this is the new question. Do you want the item to be reusable in the procurement confirmation visit? And if I say yes, what happens is if I come back to my sales order. And firstly, let's just look at the relationship map here. We can see that there's two purchase orders. One's been canceled, the other is still open. If I rerun the procurement confirmation visit, it still comes up and says, oh, you've got something to do here. It also shows me the item that was, that was canceled. I can change the supply here if I wanted to. And I can then generate the purchase order. So, so this, uh, and then if I go and look at the relationship map, I 
I can see the third purchase order has been created and it's all linked back to the sales order. Next enhancement we're going to look at is the ability to hide um, information for certain users or, or for, for certain types of transactions. So in, in particular, I'm talking about the contact person. So if you've got a contact person and let's say the contact person is inactive and you don't want to see that, per, that record no, in the business partner any longer, well, there is a general setting that you can use to do that. So if I go into the general settings area in the business partner, I can say, do not display inactive contact persons. Untick that. If I come back to my business partner master data now, and if I refresh the screen, you see that that particular record that I had made inactive has disappeared. I don't, I don't get to see it anymore. Okay, so this is particularly useful if you've got, you know, a lot of contacts and you've been using the system for a long time and you need to sort of do some maintenance on it. Next enhancement is also um, related to the business partner master record. Um, so you've got contact persons and you've got addresses, but what you don't have is a link between the two. You know, they're sort of kind of independent of each other, but that's, that's been resolved now. So on the contact person itself, now you can go in and say which address that contact person is connected to, right? And as soon as you select that, it will it will update the address details based on the contact person or, or the address you've selected, right? So now you cannot manage that data manually. It is linked to the connected address itself. Okay, so that uh, that's another enhancement around uh, business partner master data. So those those were the key enhancements. Actually, I've missed one. Uh, the the other enhancement we've got is around um, the uh, the business partner catalog numbers. So you can obviously have multiple business partner catalog numbers uh, linked to an item. And those could be for different suppliers or for the same su supplier or customer for that matter. So here I've got, you know, three catalog numbers for the same customer. And that's potentially it could be because, you know, the customer internally has changed things and, you know, they've now changed numbering or whatever it is, um, or there's a different version of the product and they want to have a slightly different numbering, but we don't care about that. So, so you can have all these multiple ones, but what you can also have is the ability to define which one is the default, right? So you can set a different default per customer uh, when it comes to those catalog numbers. So those were the enhancements around feature pack 2011 and 2102. There, there, were, there were a few more that I haven't covered because we quite don't have the time, but uh, if you do want to look at uh, you know what else is uh, has been enhanced please do go have a look at the roadmap and later on we're going to also show you some additional information on how to access uh, the roadmap and uh, enhancement details uh, directly from within SAP. Um, so just while we're here I'm just going to cover a couple of other enhancements that were introduced earlier in version 10 so it's worth pointing out so very quickly run through a couple of them. So firstly, we've got um, in the financial reports area, you've got now the ability to drill down back into the GL account. So let's say you run a PNL. Now you've got the golden arrow on the GL account back to the underlying transaction. So that, that came out in one of the earlier releases of uh, version 10. Um, the other one is the ability to have um, tab level authorizations on master data screen. So what did I mean by that? If you're looking at the BP master, you can set authorizations to say particular user only has access to the general tab or the context or the addresses and so on. So this authorization is available both for business partner screens as well as for item master screens. So the same thing tab wise. And I'll just quickly show you where that's um, available. So under authorizations and general authorizations, if we look at um, 
inventory. And if you just expand on item master, you can see all the tabs on your item master are now available as authorizations. So you can fully control who gets access to what parts of the master data. Um, next enhancement we've got is the ability to um, um, update UDFs on the line level even after the transaction has been closed. So that, that ability is through uh, document settings. So by each transaction, you've got this checkbox that says allow update of user-defined fields when document rows are not editable. What that means is either the, the transaction has been closed or canceled or converted into a, you know, a higher level, higher document. So in the case of a sales order, it might have been converted to a delivery, but you want to go back and update some UDFs at the line level, but you've got to tick this checkbox and then you'll be able to do that. Now that's available across a number of transactions, as you can see, um, you just need to uh, go and activate it. Um, Next one, you probably already noticed this. If, you, if you're already using version 10, you'll be aware of this. If you haven't, and um, you might have spotted it, but when you're doing a transaction entry, the add button has three modes. You can either add and say, bring the screen back to new, which is the standard operation, operation in versions prior to 10. You know, it just comes up with a blank screen. Or you can say add and show me the screen, or you can say add and just close the screen because I'm done with the sale order screen. So it just gives you a bit more uh, ability to control what happens next. Um, and the final one, V10, uh, that's worth mentioning is uh, production related. So you now have the ability to have the parent item also being a child item on a production order. Um, note that it can only be if you're using a special type production order. You cannot do it in a bill of material. Um, so the thought, you know, the general use case for this would be where you're doing some sort of repairs on an item, or you might need to do some rework after the production has been done. So for example, I've got this printer and it got slightly damaged in transit, or it's come back and I've got to do a repair. So what I can do is I can say, you know, I'm going to push in a negative one. I'm going to consume this item, and I'm also going to put, um, rather, I'm going to use this item, and I'm also going to put a part into it, um, perhaps a system board, and that's that's my production order. And then I can complete the repair and, and receive the product back into the system. That covers um, the version 10 updates. Um, uh, just a reminder again, we do have a number of videos on our YouTube channel, not just um, in relation to uh, version 10, but you know, a lot of different videos run various modules of SAP and training, training material that you can go uh, view um, in your own time. So what I'll do is now hand over to um, Ashwin, Thank you, Ketan. Um, hi, everyone. I'll be taking you through a new product called MI Portal, um, the system. This is uh, designed to uh, work as a mobile and uh, web scanning solution. Um, it can manage transactions together with inventory flows. We have the ability to configure new sets of transactions from business one, and this can be deployed rather quickly for um, businesses. A uh, few benefits that you would get with MI Portal is obviously it can increase your productivity, for example, in your warehouse to record uh, stock transactions. Uh, it's a simple interface. Um, if you have used um, web browsers and um, other portals, then it is similar to that. Um, there is no need for complicated full scale uh, solution with this particular product and you can reduce your inventory management and admin overheads by bolting um, this uh, MI portal on your SAP system. And you can connect to any scanner on the web or mobile device. You can eliminate errors and improve uh, accuracy of your stock records. 
I will take you through a demo of a um, few of the transactions, a look and feel of the MI portal screen, and um, we will then um, move on from there. So those are the things on the list. I will show you how those things work in uh, the system. Right, so this is the um, MI portal screen. There is the login screen before this. So it is similar to business one login screen. Uh, you need to have a business one license and it can also work with the indirect access license that um, can be assigned to your users. So for example, if your warehouse users do not have a full SAP license or a limited license, um, you can get the um, indirect access license and use that with MI Portal. Uh, uh, sorry, use that, set it up in SAP and then uh, use it in MI Portal. The logins need to be created in SAP though. So once the users log in, this is a simple menu you get. It is a lightweight version of um, what we call Business One but we can enhance it to how we, uh, how a client uh, needs the system to look like. So let's go into this. Um, obviously here we can pop in your logo and there are certain menus right now. You can also, we can increase these menus. For example, if we need to introduce production, issue for production, receive from production or master data, those can be easily bolted into the system. So let's have a look at a few of the menus here. Uh, obviously we have a sales transaction, so we can, for example, create a sales order. So when we create, uh, click on create sales order. So this particular option here is showing you that we have the ability in MI portal to create transactions also. In this case, I'm going to create a sales order. So for example, if the scenario is you're in a store and you have the MI portal on a iPad or an Android device and the customer is there, you're taking an order from the customer, you can do this online on, on this MI portal screen. And let's say you have a particular product. The system works based on barcodes. So uh, I'm gonna copy this particular barcode. That's the particular item code. And what we can do is directly, there's no items listed here. You can either do a find from here choose your group of products and within that group of products you can do and then add the item codes directly from here the items required or you can go directly in here and scan the product so when you do the scan the product the item already automatically comes up and each time by default you will get quantity as one but you keep scanning let's say customer wants two of those you do that, the quantity keeps incrementing. Now these columns here, are, we can customize these columns, we can bring in your prices, we can bring in any UDFs you have currently on your sales order screen, and we can also um, co put in there formatted searches. So that UDF can also trigger a, format, uh, a column that can trigger the formatted search. There's also a signature pad, so I can do something here. Now, the idea behind this is you already have, for example, sales order and you need to do a delivery and uh, we go to do delivery and using this particular portal, we can get the customer to sign. Once that's done, you will click on submit and the system can take the um, sales order into um, SAP directly. And please note, this is a real-time system. There is no offline capability here. So, um, um, you either are connected to uh, um, your SAP system via internet or VPN um, and the system will straight away save the document in your SAP system. So I've done that sales order right now and let me go to my sales order screen. That's the last one I did and under the attachments tab you can see the signature document. So similarly, we can, if a sales order is already existing, like we have over here, we want to now create an AR invoice. We can 
um, do that also. The system will list all the outstanding sales orders in your system, or if you need outstanding delivery notes in the system, you can search across all your different um, sales orders, and this is a wildcard multi-select uh, search. So if I say uh, maxi, then all maxis will come up, and then I can say space 839, then it does maxi and 839 search together. So that is available across the system. You can select um, these sales order you want, and then obviously scan the products or uh, enter the quantities that you want. I could go in here, enter the quantity directly, or just scan with the barcode in here, and the quantity will increment. What you can also do is you say two over there, and then you can also go five and scan the item. And what will happen is it will, in that didn't happen correctly, so just bear with me. It will increase the quantity. So what will happen is this then goes, you click on submit and the invoice gets created. On the purchasing side also, we can create, so let's say you have purchase orders in your system, we can list all the purchase orders, open purchase orders here, select the purchase order you want to do a goods receipt on, and scan the particular items that are there on that purchase order, and when you click submit, the goods receipt PO is created. Stock takes also can be done in uh, my portal. Now, the process for stock take is that in your business one system, the stock counting sheet needs to be created first um, in SAP. And what you need to do then is um, the items that are there, choose your items in SAP, and then MI Portal brings up that open uh, stock inventory count sheet. Click on the um, count that you want and you can start scanning and the quantities over here get updated. When you click on submit, the system will come and update the uh, open quantity here. Then from here, you do the process in SAP of finalizing that inventory counting by going to copy to inventory posting. We can also do the uh, stock transfers. So the uh, process here is that one warehouse need, will request the um, stock from another warehouse. In that case, a inventory transfer request is created, and we can say we are requesting from the headquarters on the Tempe warehouse. As you can note, there is a goods in transit warehouse that is required, and in here also we can find and um, choose the items or scan the items that we are requesting. What the system does is it will create an inventory transfer request in SAP. Now, the users then, when they are ready to send it from the HQ warehouse, they will go into the send option and they will see all the uh, inventory requests that need to be actioned. They will send this um, data, uh, it's our inventory request, and from their side, it's actioned to go to the transit warehouse and obviously the receiving warehouse then needs to do the similar function and do a receive function. So um, this is managing your flow, inventory flow from warehouse to warehouse using the in-transit um, warehouse. Reporting can also be done. So in here we have the ability to see some open reports. Um, these are all query based. So obviously it is customizable to what type of report you want based on query but together with it, we can also put in a crystal report that you can um, click, give in a parameter and run on the, uh, on the screen and later on export to PDF and save that or email that from your device. Again, on here, the search button is again RSH. If I do that, it is multi-column um, search and can say I just want the 103, so you can see it's got RSH here and 03 here, and I can see my stock on hand information. 
so yes you can we can put many reports in here for the users and all of these menus current menus can be controlled based on the roles and the users that are in the system so if you don't want someone to do purchase order receipts that user can that authorization can be taken off also we can further to these ones we can introduce more menus for example you create a sales uh, sales order maybe from a sales quotation so we could put create sales quotation here and then you can say create delivery create returns so this portal can be further enhanced to you based on the customers requirements of the transactions they want to give to they to the users in the system so that is the mainly the um, the MI portal that I had to show you all. The architecture for this um, MI portal, it runs on IIS. Um, it is compatible with any browser out there right now, it's Firefox, uh, Google, Edge. Uh, all users set up in SAP require indirect like access license. That is obviously um, for those who are not normal users. If you have a professional license, you can use that also. It, the integration is done via B1IF, which is an integration framework provided with every install to all the um, clients. It is real time and there is no offline capabilities. So if you have internet issues, then the uh, MI portal will uh, not work. And now we're into the tips and tricks. So let's uh, get right into it. Um, so first tip we're going to look at is um, let's close all this. Um, just posting periods and you know various statuses and how these work for you. So firstly, let's have a look at a period and see what the statuses are. So under administration, system visualization, posting periods, um, and I'll just pick the current period, you know, which is uh, April, and you'll see. The statuses, you've got four options. You can have unlocked, which means that you know whoever's got access and authorization can process a transaction. Um, you've got unlocked except sales, which means that all users apart from the salespeople can perform transactions. So you know, this is to stop your salespeople from being cheeky and putting in transactions back into a prior month to, month to get in get their commissions. Uh, the next one is closing period, which is where your, um, um, you know, your accounts team is finalizing um, the books and, you know, posting journals, maybe some adjustments, but you don't want any of the AR uh, purchasing or sales or production related transactions going through. And once uh, the, um, you know, the accounts uh, finalize the month, you set the status to lock, which means no further transactions can be performed in that period. Now, of course, you can come back and change the status uh, back to closing or unlocked and, and perform whatever other adjustments you need to make. Um, and just, um, there's also a couple other um, things you need to consider when setting up the periods and uh, setting, up the, um, um, setting up the authorization levels. So unlocked obviously means not, anything can happen and lock means nothing can happen. But two in between are driven by authorizations. So let's have a look at that. So we go into general authorization, let's pick a user and uh, let's look at, uh, okay, so there are a couple of authorizations here under general, um, one that says unlocked except sales. So what do you do is, um, you know, all your salespeople you don't give them access to this particular authorization status. Um, and then likewise with your period closing, the only people who have access to this would be the people um, who, are, who are in your finance department. So, you know, purchasing and sales will not have access to this. So this way you can control who can post transactions into a particular period as you're sort of finalizing the month or, or, or that particular posting period. All right. Um, so that's um, posting periods and statuses. Um, the next, uh, so what, sorry, while just we're here, just another thing to note, when you are creating your periods, make sure you've put your due date um, to be sort of 
the longest period you give um, terms to your customers or suppliers. So, for example, if you've got 90 days terms, to so make sure the due date of the final period of the year is is at least 120 days out from the end of the financial year. Otherwise, you're going to end up with uh, errors such as posting period is not, uh, you know, the date deviates from permissible range type errors will come through. So just bear that in mind when you are setting up your posting periods. Okay, let's let's now the next tip we're going to look at is address formats. So when you're setting up your BP master, in there you've got um, you know your different addresses and you set up the various components of the address and you store that information. So you've got you know your street, the block, the city, the postcode. You can have county, or county is not uh, applicable in Australia, but you know if you go to the UK and some other countries, county is important. Um, you've got the state. The country or region. And note that you know now we've got an extra option here. It says regions, it's not country. And then you've got all these other things such as street number, building floor roof. Now all of those components are available when you're setting up the address format. Now in different countries, different components are applicable. So SAP allows you to configure the um, the address format by country. So where do you do that? Under administration, set up business partner. So firstly, let's look at countries and regions. So in here, you've got a list of all the countries um, that, that are defined in the system. And against each country, you can assign a address format. Right? So you may at some point start you know, importing stuff, for instance, from Angola. Now, you know, if you are importing from Angola, then you may have a specific address format that you want to use. And, you know, right now the default in the SAP system is the European standard format, but then that may not be the most applicable. So what you can do is uh, define a new address format and assign that to that country. Now let's have a look at how we do that. So you go into address formats. Um, it's going to find and I'll come up with a list of formats that are already in the system. And let's look at uh, the Australian one. Okay, so this. Standard Australian one that's been done in the system says it's building floor room slash street number space street city space state space postcode and then region. Now, in your case, you may have an additional line that says, you know, I've got a second line on my address. I don't want to really use building and all this kind of stuff. I want to use block and I want to define my own address format. So, for, firstly, let's look at how this address. Um, pushes through into a transaction. So when you pick a customer, you see this address, right? Now this address is based on the address format that's defined. If you click onto this address components, you can see where those bits and pieces are coming from. Um, and if you wanted to change the address format, you, you can do it. You just um, go in and manipulate this. You can for example, add a low, move the country and region down, move the city one level down, go into, um, let's say, the um, pretext and put a space in there, select state, go back again and put a pretext in another space, go into the next field and uh, put the zip code in. And then on this line, you can go delete, delete. And let's say the second line is the block. And once you've done that, you update it, and that, that basically saves it and becomes the address format. Now, no, do not just go off and change your address formats very nearly. You might have some sort of a method to how it's been set up. Please, please do talk to, to someone who's set up your system before you go off and do this. You know, it's, it's pretty safe if you're sort of dealing with another country and you're, you're trying to set up a format, but if you've already got an established system with uh, address formats predefined, please um, you know, bear that in mind before you go change anything. Okay, um, so that uh, next uh, uh, tip we're gonna look at is um, 
you know, where, where is my price coming from for a transaction? So when you're doing a transaction um, and you pick a customer and you pick, you know, some items, you'll see a few things. Um, so firstly, if there is special pricing involved, you'll notice that the price itself is in a slightly different color. You'll see, you'll notice that it's in blue. So the first two lines, the price show up in a slightly different uh, color. And in the third line, there's no sort of, you know, it's, it's just in the standard black, which means there's no special price applicable. But so that's the first thing to be aware of. The next thing is, there is a column here called price source. Now, if you go into form settings, you can make that field visible if it's not. All right, you can make it visible. And then it tells you where is the price coming from or is there any specials uh, applicable, right? Now, the third thing is if you do pick an item and then if you change the price, the price source changes as well. So systems keeping a track of whether the price has been manually updated or the system, you know, it's, it's the standard system uh, specified one. Um, the other thing you can do is if you right click on the price and you go into the price report, it'll actually show you where the price has come from. So, you know, and you can see here that there is a um, discount group that's also a special, special price applicable on this particular uh, customer. So, you know, if I come back in here, let me just do this. Let's put a 10% on there. Click update. Let's add the item back in. All right, and you can see that it's now saying special prices for business partners. If I go right click on it and say, show me the price report, it, it shows me where the price is coming from. On the second line here, it's saying it's active price list and discount groups. If I right click on that, and if I say price report, I'll just, I'll just see the normal things. So it's 375, but you'll notice that there's a second option here called discount group report. We know that there's a discount group applicable. So if I go into the discount group report, I see now that this is coming from discount groups and there's a 5% on items belonging to the JB printer group. If I drill into that, I can see, there it is, there's the setup. Customer Mexitech gets 5% through a discount group on whatever price list they're linked to. So it gives you a lot of capability and flexibility around where's the price coming from? Has it been manipulated manually? Um, and you know, you get clear visibility of what, what, what's going on from a pricing perspective. Okay, on to the next uh, tip then. Um, if you're uh, if you've got specific functions in the system that you're not using and you know you really are never going to use what you can do is turn them off from a configuration perspective so they don't even appear for your users and confuse them so where do you do that so under administration system initialization general settings there's a hide function uh, hide functions um, setup now it's only applicable for these particular functions. So, you know, you can hide budget setup, you can hide the payment visit, dining visit, cost accounting, serial and batches, production module, MRP, and units of measure. And if you if you tick any one of these, it'll 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 seem as if that particular function does not exist in the system at all. It, you know, it, it was never there. So for example, if I go in and say hide production. Production is pretty much gone from the system. You can see there's no reference to production in the main menu, and I can't even access that from the module system as if it never existed. And you can also see that the resources menu item has also disappeared. If I go back and turn that on, and now it's back. You can see both resources and production are now visible and uh, users can go in and uh, use those functions. So this is not even authorization level, this is at an overall system level. Regardless of the person having access, 
from an authorization perspective, if you hide that function, it's as if it never existed. Okay, um, the next uh, tip we're gonna look at is, is how you can um, manipulate the data in a query grid or, or in any sort of grid. So if you are running a, for example here, I'm gonna run a query, a customer list query, which we looked at before. So once I've got the query result, if I wanted to know what the total of these balances is, I can hold the control key and click on the account balance column header, and I get a total, right? It's got a control click, I get a total, 1.28 million. Now, what else can I do here? I can sort data. I can double click on the header and sort the data, and I can sort by, you know, whatever, any column in the grid. What else can I do? Well, if I if I want a secondary sort, so let's say my first sort is on the um, the group name, and I want a secondary sort, I can go into the sort table option, and in here I can do a second sort, and I can say the second sort is based on the balance. Right. So now I've got a secondary sort, um, and and you know you can have additional sorts if, if required and I can also restore the default. Um, the next uh, nice feature you have around manipulating these grids is the ability to filter the data. Right? You can go filter table, and in there you can then say filter, you know, and in my case, let's say I just wanna see all my large accounts. I click on filter, and, and then the data gets filtered based on that, but also the totals are also based on the filtering I've just done. Okay, um, and the filter is reasonably powerful. You can, you know, have a lot of different options here. It's blank, is not blank, smaller than, greater than, contains, and so on. So, for example, if I wanted um, to um, to go in and say contains, then I can go in and just type in any text I want, and then I get a filter in that manner. All right, so that's uh, so filtering and um, sorting. Now, if you are running any other standard reports, for example, uh, the open items list or the back order report and things like that, um, you know, you can again do filtering. Obviously, um, totals are not available here because uh, that's only on the query, but, but you can sort data pretty easily. Um, you can also filter data fairly easily, right? So the filter is available on pretty much any other reports uh, that that you you'll run in the system. Okay, next tip we're going to look at is um, the returns process. So you know, typically when you are returning a uh, you know s some item article back from a uh, supplier or from from a customer. Um, you probably will put it into a different warehouse. You know, you might have a quality or a returns warehouse where you want to inspect the item and, and make sure it's all okay before you transfer it back into your, or your normal stock. Well, as part of that process, wh what could happen is, if, particularly if you're running standard, if you're running moving average costing in your system, when, when you do the return, and if you don't have, if you've never had that item in the returns warehouse, the stock will come back at the moving average cost that belongs to that uh, that's that's currently set in that warehouse. Particularly if you're doing a return that's not based on any other transaction. If you're doing a return based on a delivery, it's fine. If you're doing a return that's not based on anything, you don't have uh, the ability to specify that. Or if you're moving average, then you end up with a zero cost item. So there is a setting in the system which you have to turn on. Uh, which allows you to set the return cost, right? So I've turned it on and I can see there's the enable cost setting. I can tick that and then I can say what cost I want it to be returned at. Now there's some other uh, configuration settings in play here as well. So if I go into administration, system initialization and document settings and in returns, 
you can see as a checkbox, allow setting of item cost when document is not based. Now, if this wasn't ticked, I would not have seen these columns and these options here at all. These would not be available. What you also see is you can also specify a price list as a default at which it should come through. All right, so, so it's worth having a look at that, particularly if you're managing returns and, and the returns are going into a separate warehouse. Okay, uh, the next tip we're going to look at is uh, the ability to maximize the grids on screen. So if you have uh, any, any of the screens when you're doing your data entry, um, you've got this option to maximize the grid. So there's this little arrow sitting on the top of the um, grid area. You click on that and you basically get a full screen. The header and the footer level disappears. You can you know, do all your data entry, manage all your information, and then once you're done, you click back on it and that sort of max minimizes or, or removes the uh, maximize mode. And then you can uh, finalize the transaction. Okay. Um, Next tip we're going to look at, um, and you know, we, I still get surprised by the number of uh, people who still don't use the payment visit um, option um, available or functionality available in SAP to work out which suppliers need to be paid, and then uh, you know, once they've run that process, um, you know, to to then generate the bank file that's uploaded to your bank to uh, to uh, to make that payment. So let's have a look at that very quickly. So under banking uh, payment wizard, all right, so it basically takes you through, the, through a process of identifying which suppliers need to be paid. There is, there is a bit of setup that needs to be done behind the scene. You know, you have to define the banks, you have to define some codes, um, and you have to set up your suppliers with which bank account you pay from. So there's a bit of configuration, but once you've done that, you run the visit, you run, you know, you start a payment run, you define what are you doing. So let's, in this case, you know, generally you'd be doing an outgoing payment and you'd be doing it as a bank transfer. You go through, and in, in this screen here, you define which suppliers you are paying. So you can, you know, filter based on supplier groups. You can filter based on uh, properties if need be. Um, but also you can just click, you know, you can click on add to list and then you can untick specific suppliers you do not wish to consider for payment um, in this one. So you've done, done that. You also got the ability to do expanded selection criteria. And then, you know, you've got any UDF that you can use um, or you know any field or UDF you can use to do uh, your filtering. So I'm going to select all the suppliers. Here we go next, and in here, then you can control what invoices should be considered for payment. Right? I mean, this is probably the key filter to say, well, you know, I'm only going to pay people with invoices that are due, let's say, up till 12th of April. So anything after 12th of April will not be included. Um, next, here is a couple of payment methods. So these have already been defined in the system um, through the payment method set up. And once, once you've done that and you've allocated that to the specific suppliers, um, these, you know, these come through and can be selected. So we select the payment methods, we go through, and then the system gives us a list of invoices that need to be paid. All right, if I click on expand all, I get to see the full listing. From here, I can control which invoices should be paid. I mean, I can tick and untick specific uh, invoices. And I can also part pay an invoice. If I only want to pay $100 on this particular invoice, I can do that. And if I don't see a particular invoice in the list, for whatever reason, I can click on this non-included transaction button. And if there is something in that list, um, I, would, I would see it. 
Okay, let's just try this. I'm going to change the max outgoing amount to $10,000 only. Right now, if I go run this again, I'll probably see some fewer invoices potentially, and I might see some things that haven't been included. And you can see there it's saying, you know, document is greater than the max amount I've specified in my payment visit run. From here, I can, as again, select the invoices being paid. I'll go next, and I can execute the payment run. As soon as I execute this, it will generate, um, and in my case, it will generate two outgoing payments for the two suppliers I've selected for payment. Um, it's, it's asking me, do I want to continue because this will mass generate transactions? And once it's completed, it's saying two payments were added. Um, I can go and see what, what those were, you know, which bank accounts they came from, which supplier was paid, how much was paid. And then here you've got the bank file button. You can go in and generate the files that are needed. Obviously, there's some additional um, information that needs to be defined in the setup. If it's not, uh, if it's not defined, then, you know, those, the file will not get generated. But um, for Australia, you know, the standard ABA file format comes in the box with, uh, with SAP Business One. Um, with, uh, if you've got a, you know, if you've got a slightly different bank, not one of your standard Australian banks, then you, we, we can customize the file formats for you. Uh, with New Zealand, we have, you know, a number of different formats that uh, we, we can supply, but there isn't, there isn't a standard one uh, supplied by SAP. But you know that we can we can generate those file formats uh, if required. Um, yeah, and then you once you've generated the file, you go into your online banking system and upload the file, and and the payment gets done. Hey, um, all right. So we'll move to the next uh, topic here, which is uh, um, the form UI editing ability. Now you might have noticed when I opened up my sales order screen the ship to information was sitting not in the logistics tab but in uh, you know onto the main grid and how did i do that i went through the edit form ui so you just go tools edit form ui now, you, now you're in the edit mode and then you can sort of let's say store default and that brings back the standard whatever it was um, you can then um, you know, manipulate it the way you want. So for example, maybe the approved checkbox is important for you. You move that to the main grid. All right. And then um, once you close the screen, it'll ask you if you want to save it. You save it, yes. And then you open up the screen and there is the approved checkbox. You can also use this uh, functionality to move UDFs onto the main grid as well if needed. Now, this is me as a super user and manipulating the form UI. Now, if you're not a super user, you won't be able to do that. You need, or you need at least authorizations to do it. But as an administrator of the system, you've got the capability of managing in bulk UI configuration templates, right? So under administration utilities, UI configuration template, you can define a whole heap of different templates. And within each template, you can define the forms that you wanna manipulate and and then you assign users to that particular form ui or you can assign user groups to that form ui as well so it's a it's a it's a choice to you which which of the two you're managing your system by if you've got groups then you can assign by groups or you can assign to specific users and then you go into the edit form ui for each form and then you manipulate the data And then you save the settings. And uh, you can also do, um, once you've done that, you can then also um, copy the form settings from one um, you know, template to another and so on. But it gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of standardizing the look and feel across the business and making sure that people are only seeing information they want to see. Because with the edit form UI, you can certainly also go in and say, you know, 
right click on a field and say hide this so you know it could be a field that is no longer visible to the user or you can you know totally remove a tab or you can disable a field as well so there's a lot of flexibility around this um, so we're uh, having a bit more of a look and play with all right next uh, topic we're going to look at I, I mentioned this earlier in the piece that you know you you can access you know things like product roadmap um, what's been released in, in most recent uh, patches and so on directly from the uh, SAP menu system. So under help, you've got SAP links, right? So there's all these useful links that take you to the system um, and give you more information. So you can click on the roadmap, it'll open up the roadmap. All right? now you do need a SAP login as user. Um, you can register yourself. You generally, most most customers would have a S user manager um, internally. And if you don't know who that is, you know, please uh, reach out to the support desk, and they can you know set you up if required. But you, I think you can also just register yourself if you're just trying to access some of this uh, uh, information uh, that's not uh, you know directly relevant to your setup. So you can access. Um, Let's have a look again. You can access the help portal, right? And there's a lot of material here around um, the solution. Um, you know, help files for SAP, business one, for the integration, for the mobile apps, uh, and so on. You can even access the customer influence channel. So this is where you can submit your ideas for improvements. Uh, within SAP Business One and then what happens is uh, various people vote on it and you know if there's enough votes uh, for the product uh, feature then SAP introduces that into the roadmap and, and delivers it uh, down the track so um, you know please, please do have a look at what you find now depending on the version you have you may not see all of these options. You know, some of these have sort of been introduced in, in the most recent versions, but there will be some form of a, I mean, access to SAP links in your version, unless you're running a very old version of uh, SAP Business One. All right, next tip. Um, we get this one quite often. Um, you know, we'll get a call saying, you know, there's something broken in the system. My general ledger doesn't meet match the um, the aging report or you know the PNL doesn't match uh, the balance sheet or something along those lines and you know quite often um, it's because of the options you've selected in terms of running the reports that you're running so specifically around this uh, my general ledger doesn't match the aging report um, the first thing to mention is that it's almost impossible for that to happen with SAP Business One, and that's because when you define your um, general ledger or your your control accounts uh, in terms of uh, um, debtors or creditors, it is it needs to be marked as a control account. And as soon as you do that, you're not permitted to do direct journal entries into the GL account. So there's no way you can have a situation where the sum of your customer balances doesn't half match your trade debtors account. Um, you know, or, or similarly for the accounts payable side of things. So, so why would you have that issue? But generally you have that issue when you run your aging report, and let's just run that. So you run the custom aging report, and you've unticked this checkbox that says display customers with zero balance. It's, it's slightly misleading because what this does is if you're backdating your aging report, which you you know quite often do because you want to see what the position of your aging was, you know back in uh, let's say end of the financial year or back you know back month ago or whatever that period may be. Now, if you tick this box, what it'll do is it'll exclude those customers that have a zero balance today. They may have a balance back in the day, but they no longer have a balance today. If you if you untick this, you'll you'll quite you know you quite possibly not have you know a match between your general ledger and your aging report so please bear this one in mind this is probably the most important one that you must tick this box when you're running your aging report if, if you're backdating it and if you want to see 
the two uh, the two sub the sub ledger and the general ledger mesh. So we'll look at the next tip, uh, which is um, assigning or applying a payment against an order. So you're doing a sales order, and you know you want to take a deposit on that sales order. Um, so let's again let's pick the customer, pick a couple of items, put a delivery date in, and let's say you know you want to take it. You want to take a deposit or a, or, a, or a prepayment of some sort against this. So what you do is you click on the payment means, and that opens up the uh, the payments for you know the payments means screen. Now what this is doing is in the background it's creating either a down payment invoice or a down payment request without you needing to sort of go through that whole process. So you get a down payment invoice. Let's say for example you pick that as an option and then you put the full amount because you, you want you know full payment and then you click on add. If you come back to that invoice or, or that order and if you just right click and look at the relationship map you'll see automatically in the background the system has created a down payment invoice and a linked AP invoice to it. Right? Just happens automatically. Now you obviously need to think about what that accounting impact of using this method is, you know, because now you'll have some sort of a balance sitting, um, you know, in in a uh, in a general ledger account. It's a prepayment type uh, balance, and then what happens is finally when you do the invoice to the customer, because there's a prepayment or down payment, it is applied, and the final invoice balance is zero. So probably need to consider what uh, what the accounting implications are, but if, uh, just worth noting that you can now take a payment against an order without having to you know, key in all the additional transactions. Um, now this is only available from 9.3 PL5, so if you're on an older version than that, then you will not see that. Um, so the next uh, tip we've got is around the ability to um, create a um, credit on an invoice that's been fully paid. Right, so you've got an, if you've got an order and the order gets converted to an invoice, and let's say as part of the invoicing process, we're also going to pay it at the same time. So this is now a fully paid invoice, right? What happens is as soon as an invoice has been fully paid, you cannot copy it to a credit, right? It's it's closed. There's nothing more you can do with it. Since 9.3, again, PL5, you can go into the invoice, right-click on it, and say, change document status to open, right? Once you do that, you now have two options from copy to. You can either copy it to a return request and go through a full returns process, or you can assign a credit to this. So, you know, if, even though they've paid for it, there was a problem with the product, one of the items is being returned. Um, let's say the first line, I've got to return one of them. Second line, none being returned. I can do a credit. Right, and then, uh, Sorry, let's just look at the messages again. Credit memo greater than open balance continue. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't have a choice. I'll have to pay them or I'll have to refund them or apply the balance later on. Uh, do you want to reopen the items in the original sales order? So this is saying you're doing a credit on a sales order from way back. Do you want to ship those goods again? If I say yes, the, credit, the actual sales order lines will become open and I can then... Um, create another delivery against those lines if need be. So let's say yes. And then it's finally warning me that I cannot change this. So yes, I'm happy with that. So if you look at uh, the credit, it's open. If I look at the relationship map, there it is. I'll go back to the sales order. So there's that line that's still open. I can then create another invoice against that for, for the quantity that's open. And then probably to, you know, because this is a replacement of the item that I, that was, let's say, damaged, 
um, we've got to somehow then close this uh, invoice off against uh, against the credit by doing an internal reconciliation against these two so that they're also closed off. Okay, um, so that's uh, crediting a fully paid invoice. Let's now look at uh, duplicating items and what happens with barcodes. So there's a new setting that got introduced some point in version 10 around barcodes and what happens to them when you duplicate. Um, and there's the setting that says duplicate barcodes when duplicating items. Now, if this is ticked. What happens is when you duplicate an item, so let's say this item has a barcode and I'm duplicating it, it's it's also duplicated the barcode. I mean, that doesn't make a lot of sense in most cases because, you know, you're, you're sort of, you know, creating a new item and that new item should have a new barcode. Um, if, if that's the sort of standard for you, then untick this box so that when you are creating or duplicating, so you see there's the barcode there, we can duplicate, the barcode doesn't come through. Okay, so this gives you a little bit more usability around duplicating. Now, for the final tip of the day, let's have a look at managing of dates on transactions. Okay, so pick a customer. I can put some items in, but the main thing we're going to focus on here is the date field, right? So I, bring, I think probably most of you know that if you put any alphabet, any character on, on a field, let's say for example T for today, and you hit the tab, it will put today's date in, right? That's sort of the standard. Now, if you, if you want to put, if you want to put, um, let's say, another date in the current month, let's say the 20th, you can just type in 20, hit tab, and the rest of the month gets populated. If you want to put the 20th of next month, you can go 2005 and hit tab, and the rest it'll it'll put as the current year. Now, what else can you do? Let's say you want to to put in a date that's uh, two weeks from now, exactly 14 days. You can just go plus 14 and tab. And then it just puts in, you know, it adds 28 days or 14 days to the date you've entered. Or it can be plus 100 and we put 100 days. Or it could be, let's say, minus 10. And it'll just put 10 days back from the posting date here. Let's say you've put a date in and now you want to change it and you want to push it two days forward. What can you do? Well, you can use the up and down arrow to move the dates back and forth. So if I hit the up arrow once, it moves forward one date. If I hit it again, it goes another day forward. Hit it again, it keeps going forward one day at a time. And if I hit the down arrow, it goes backwards one day at a time. So there's a lot of flexibility around, you know, date entry. You know, you don't have to sit there and go into the date picker and scroll and find and, and pick the date. You know, you can very quickly enter the dates into the system. All right, um, that concludes the tips and tricks session. Uh, Thank you, Ketan. We've got a couple of questions already. So the first one here is like address formats. Can we have date formats, as your USA customer dates, displays this month, date, year? Uh, no, the system has a date format defined at a global level, and that's for, you know, that's for across the board because, you know, whatever localization you're operating in, that's the date format you define for your localization. Now, any date manipulation has to be done in Crystal, as you correctly pointed out and you can put some formulas and rules around it. So you don't have to have a separate layout per, per you know, custom or country per se. You can have some formulas within your layout so that uh, depending on the country of the customer, it, it, it does a certain type of date format. Okay, uh, so from Yoli, is it possible to restate how to manage the module access? Like that. Uh, okay, all right. 
Yeah, I think that's the um, hide function. So that's under administration, system initialization, general settings, hide functions. Okay, administration, system initialization, general settings. And then you go to the hide functions tab. Okay, and next question. Do we have an option to cancel AR down payments? I'm not sure actually, I've never done one. So we can have a quick look, but uh, maybe maybe the answer is no. If you're asking the question, then probably it is not possible. So let's have a look. No, I mean, I guess if it's been paid, then you have to cancel the payment. Once you cancel the payment, then you probably have the ability to um, credit it. So let's cancel the incoming payment. Okay, so that's done there. If I then go look at the AR down payment invoice, I can then, again, there isn't a cancel option. From what I can see, the only thing you can do is copy to a credit memo once you've canceled the linked payment to that transaction. Okay, that's, okay, one, there's one more here. What is the best way to run supplier aging that can include open PO to understand the future cash commitment? Um, no, that doesn't come as part of the supplier aging, unfortunately. I mean, you can, you know, if, if you're running HANA, you can have a look at the, uh, the cash flow report, potentially, that might give you some um, capabilities. Uh, so if you're familiar with this, uh, I know you do have um, HANA, so have a look at the cash flow forecast and see if that kind of gives you some visibility around it. But yeah, if you want sort of detailed customer by customer commitment, uh, then either it have to be some sort of a custom report. The aging report will not do it. Is there a way to allocate AR down payments to open invoices after the invoice is raised? For example, uh, if you're applying the AR invoice, balance and gains a previously paid down payment? No, no. So the, the whole point of the down payment invoice is that you're taking it up as part of the invoice creation process. You cannot come back later and say, I'm, I'm applying this. Okay, next one. Um, you link SAP to, is that how BI, Lucy? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so part. Yeah. Power BI is, um, you know, is essentially the way you link it is through um, ODBC connections. So, you know, like any other uh, BI tool, um, you've got to extract the data to extract the data in the right format that you're trying to report on. You possibly need to write a bunch of views or queries that you can use to, to then view the data in the Power BI uh, module. We do, we do have a team internally that uh, that works with Power BI. So if you do need some assistance with that, we can we can certainly guide you and help you with that. Okay, there's another one. Lucy, do we have a cash flow statement? Statement. Yeah, there is. Um, so in the financials statement of cash flows. Um, so there's there's two things here from a cash flow perspective. There is a cash flow report that shows you uh, what's going to happen based on transactions in the system. And then there's a statement of cash flow that tells you what has happened based on how you've tagged the transactions. Now, the statement of cash flow requires a good amount of configuration um, in terms of, you know, which what is the default um, type a transaction type for each each one of those uh, transactions. So what you've got to you've got to do a bit of setup, and then and then you can do a report on actual cash flow uh, and how the how the money was used. Another yeah. one from Ruth. Um, if you have time, can you demonstrate the way time time sheets are set up to work and how they so the time the time sheets, as far as the new projects module are concerned, um, you know, don't have any any impact on your general ledger. They're essentially just a data collection mechanism. 
But if you're trying to do timesheets against uh, production, my suggestion would be in your bill of material, you um, put in a resource, right? And a resource can be a person. Let's find a production bill of material. These aren't production. So the example here, I can have a resource and a resource uh, could be a, a type of person. And then you can say, you know, it's not backlash, it's manual. So then when you raise a production order, Right, so you have a production order and uh, you can release that and then because it's a resource and it's manual issue you'll be able to then issue components and as part of the issue components process um, you can say number of hours spent by that particular resource okay that looks like that's a wrap Kenan. thank you very much for running us through your top tips for the year